It's so good to see you, man. Good to see you, buddy. Here we are. This is episode, I think it's episode 22 of the Ken Show. There we go. Astonishing. It's actually technically like episode 25 because we had a couple double parters in there. And right. I was just letting everyone know, uh, this is going to be another double parter. So what we're going to be sure. talking about today is integral love. I think we're actually going to call the show um, Practice the Wound of Love, which was ah. excerpted from Grace and Grit. Right. Um, and it's going to be really rich. I was letting everyone know sort of what we're going to be going through, which is I've got a slew of questions for you in each of the major sort of integral buckets of right. breaking up, growing up, cleaning up, opening up, and showing up. Um, and it's, I was letting everyone know as well that it's so many questions. We're not going to get through them all today, but we're going to get through what we can today. And then we're going right. to pick up the conversation again uh, in a month. Right. So... I figure let's get started, Ken. And you okay. know, I, I think a great way to get started is actually um, to talk about this amazing film <laughs> that was just released, which I, and I think this conversation is gonna kind of bring us into the heart of the discussion today. Right. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit about Grace and Grit. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've, we've been, uh, let me just, I'm sorry, find my notes here and catch up. Uh, here we go. So yeah, so um, I wanted to let people know that I actually wrote a, uh, a short, review of the film myself, which um, I sent off to Sebastian Siegel pretty much immediately after watching. Um, I was, you know, I watched the film, Ken, and I just you found myself- You should read that. Yeah, I'll, I, I've got a portion of it. I, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll read a chunk of that. And, you know, what was interesting, Ken, was just feeling into the state that the film um, evoked for me. I mean, it was a really, really powerful state. And I found myself for the next three hours just contemplating what I had just seen and um, it kind of culminated in this appreciation that I sent to Sebastian that night. And I've got a few paragraphs from it um, that I'll share right now, Ken, and then I'll let you riff on a little bit. Um, so basically what I said was, uh, postmodern movies are self-referential. Post-postmodern movies or integral movies like this one are capital S self-referential. The directing style of this film seems to be holding a mirror to consciousness itself and how we remember our own lives, not to mention how we remember our favorite films. Not as a linear sequence from A to B to C like an Avengers movie, but as a poetic flow of contrasting scenes, feelings, interactions, and tones, all constellated by our own interior patterns of meaning making and projected onto the empty screen of witness consciousness. This is how the film presented itself to me as a purposeful series of shifting memories. And behind and between every scene, both love and ground shine forth. Every scene, every transition, every fade to black and fade to white is lit with radiant emptiness. Love and transcendence, death and liberation, passionate equanimity. These are the central themes of Grace and Grit that caused so many people to fall in love with the book. And I'm so satisfied with how they came through in this film. Absolutely love this, Sebastian. It's a precious gift that you just gave. An absolutely stunning tribute to Treya, to Ken, to love, and to ground. So that was my short review, Ken. And I'm just wondering if you have anything, you know, any reflections that you wanted to... Add? Sure. Um, and we'll be getting into a lot of the details of this as we proceed. That's right. But my general thoughts of the film was first of all, I watched it with um, a certain amount of trepidation. I mean, after all, here's a major motion picture and it's about you and this extraordinarily important person in your life, Treya. And so you've got these two extraordinarily important people, persons that are being displayed in film and even bad films 50 million people can see them right. you know they'll be even a bad one will be at two o'clock in the morning uh amc history classics you know old time films and there you are again and so i was my worst thought was that well this could be just the most embarrassing thing that I've ever seen. Um, 
but I had a lot of trust in Sebastian Stigel, the gentleman who'd made it. And I had had, I had had discussions with many grade A list Hollywood producers since the time the book came out. As a matter of fact, before the book was even released, one of the really top-notch Hollywood producers, her name is Alexander Rose, um, she had produced a whole long list of A grade movies. She did like nothing in common with Tom Hanks and Jackie Gleason, which is one of Treya's favorite films and one of mine. But she, Alexandra, was really good at this. And she was often just called Alex, so Alex Rose. Um, but she had, I had allowed New Age Journal to publish a chapter from the book before the book was released. And so the whole front cover of New Age magazine, all it had was the beginning of the last chapter, mm. which was Treya died today. And then just a short paragraph after that. And that was the only thing they had on the cover of the magazine. No other words, no advertisements, no mention of other articles they were carrying. Just that one chapter on the whole front cover of New Age. And Alex read that and was so impressed with it that she contacted me and she actually came out here to see me and spend time talking about it. And I finally agreed, fine, let's, I, because I really trust you. And I fairly well did. And then, so she took the book <clears throat> and started to attempt to make a script out of it. But she kept having trouble doing it. And I think one of the reasons is that this is a little sort of a side detail, but I think one of the things that made the book interesting and readable was that Treya had throughout her life, basically, and certainly throughout the whole time that I knew her, used to take 10, at least 10 or 15 minutes a day and write something in her journals. And it was her digestion of some important thing that had happened during the day, or maybe she read something that she thought was important and she wanted to include that, or something like that. And it turned out to be, she had a stack of journal notes about that big. And I had actually decided to destroy them after she died and I wasn't going to read them myself. And the reason was I knew she wouldn't mind if I read them, but they were just such a special alone time for her when she would be with her journal. Yeah. And I wanted that just to remain her space. So I decided not to read them. The last day of her life, when she told me she was dying and I carried her up the stairs for the last time, we walked past her journals and she just pointed at them and said, you'll need those. And that's all that was said. And I knew what she meant because she had asked me when she didn't have enough time to finish writing her book on everything that had happened, all the ups and downs, how spirituality had helped us confront these horrible ordeals and all of that. She knew she couldn't write that, so she made me promise that I would write the book. And I promised I would, and it was, of course, grace and grit. And she said, you'll need those, meaning the journals, because she knew when I started writing grace and grit, I had sort of books that you do like that. And most of the ones that you'll read that are in this character, 
there's just an, one authorial voice that talks about it. And when it comes time to say, oh, and my wife felt this, then he'll just interpret what he thought his wife was feeling. But because I had the journals, every single time I came to an important part of the story, I could state what I felt as I would put myself back in what I was feeling. I didn't ever assume that I knew more than I knew at that time. So I wouldn't say, oh, even though we, this turned out not working, I would never assume I had that kind of information. Right. So it was mostly I was saying, I think this might really work. I think this is going to go forward. This would be great. But then when it came time for saying what she felt, it wasn't just my words interpreting what she felt. I could go to her journal and take her words out and put them in. And so you really get two very distinct voices going through grace and grit. And then plus there is on occasion, I have to act as the overarching super authorial voice. I'm the guy that's writing this. So there were three voices in Grace and Grit, and you, you could hear all three of them speaking very clearly. And I think that was important. Um, so we um, I ended up with going through trying to find some producers that could like alex attempted to write a script for the movie but it just didn't work out very well because i think she was having trouble getting all three voices in to the script and then we tried for about five years i'd written a contract with her but then I basically said, you know, this isn't working and went on to at least two or three other producers. And each time we'd write a contract for it, they would try, it wouldn't work and so on. Um, and then Sebastian came along yeah. and I knew that he could do a good job of it. And so I turned it over to him and he really did with great deal of care and managing to work in all of the different voices, including at times even reading straight from Treya's journal. Mm -hmm. So it, I think for that reason, um, the general thrust of the film turned out, I thought, exquisitely. And then there was also how, and this is the next specific question, that we'll get to about what did I think about Nena Suvari's yeah. um, portrayal of Treya. Um, but because Sebastian had studied the text so much, and because he also had read so much of my material, he just had a sense of what it was like, he could write a script that was very, very powerful. Yeah. And it never dipped into modeling components, which would be so easy. Yep. I mean, I used to say, wait a minute, we already have um, this movie has already been released. It was called Love Story. And it was about boy meets girl, boy loves girl, they fall in love, girl gets terminal illness, girl dies, people cry, that's the movie. And I said, I don't, well, that's essentially the same outlines as Grace and Grit. Right. And I said, I don't want to do that, whatever, please don't do that. And so he didn't. He did a very, very good job. And as act, as director, he could really help the actors and actresses move into portraying Treya and Ken very, very accurately. Interesting. So I yeah. thought that was good. Um, and when I did sit down to watch it the first time, 
I was a bit on pins and needles because again, yeah. here it comes, the story of your life on the big screen and any big boo-boo or anything that looked really soppy or stupid or even self-aggrandizing any aspects of yourself that could betray um, is going to be in print forever. And like I said, it's going to be shown on nightly, old time, you know, um, maybe didn't make it to be a huge bestseller, but it's still fine for a early morning <laughs> archaic um, film. But I was on balance, very happy with it. Mm. And one of the things that makes me feel that that's not just my own response um, is that I've heard now an enormous number of feedback on the film. And they're all universally very, very positive. Mm. So I knew it wasn't just me and my film. Wasn't it great seeing me up there? Um, I was just glad to get through it without getting horribly embarrassed. Right. So once that was over, then I could look back on just how good Sebastian had to do a film that I wouldn't get embarrassed <laughs> by. And that sounds like just a negative, oh, I saw no negatives in the film. And it could sound like just a negative colored um, feedback on the film. But just to say there was no negatives was itself a huge positive. Right. And so after I went through it the first time and then got to think about the positive aspects of it that that's when those really came to the fore and any um any of the times i've gotten in discussions with the film like we just had one with sebastian siegel and marianne williamson and deepak chopra yep. and that kind of thing um they all reacted in a very positive manner and so i felt very good about how it's done and i'm not um flinching when i hear oh we're showing it at this big film festival or stuff like that right they're already doing that and they're already getting a lot of awards for it that's amazing yeah ken when when the film was was released um you know, there was there was a period of time between when the film was released and when I actually got a chance to watch it, right? It was about a 24 hour cycle before I got to watch it. And all I felt in that 24 hour period was just this incredible vulnerability. There was an incredible, I mean, all around. So there's a vulnerability on behalf of Sebastian, who's about to release this thing that, you know, this labor of love that he's poured himself into, releasing it into the world, into let's just say a very, very cynical culture that, as I often say, tends to define its tastes in negative space, right? Yeah. I don't know what I do like, but I sure as hell I'm going to tell you what I don't like. Right. That's how much so much of our sort of critical culture um, is these days. Right. So you're releasing this, you know, this, this, um, again, this beautiful, it's just dripping with authenticity and with meaning and with, you know, just sort of this has this transpersonal current running through it and you're you're delivering it into this deeply cynical culture. So there's one layer of, of vulnerability. Then there's a the vulnerability that, you know, Mina and Stuart Townsend must have felt, you know, I mean, people are going to be judging on how well they inhabited these roles and portrayed these characters. And then there's your vulnerability. And there's so many layers to that, Ken, because all of a sudden this story is now being judged, right? Yeah. And it's, there's several different kind of layers to that story that's being judged. I mean, people are judging the film for what it is, right? So that's one version of the story. Then you have the book version of the story. But then, you know, I was also really feeling into Ken that there's another version of this story, which is just yours, right? I mean, you have a set of memories and a set of experiences with Treya, much of which made it into the Grace and Grit book. But I mean, 
anyone who's been through any kind of trauma knows that there's certain elements of that that you're keeping to yourself, right? There are certain parts of that story that are just yours and hers, and no one else needs to know about it. And so I feel all of these kind of layers being put into the spotlight all of a sudden. And, you know, I don't think it was any surprise at all that we saw like the the glib New York Times review that we saw, which I thought that review was hilarious, Ken, because they walked into every criticism that you've ever had of New York Times. You famously say that New York Times and, you know, mainstream media as a whole, but particularly the New York Times has exactly two categories for spirituality, either religious fundamentalism or new age wackery. And when they have something like this that they don't know you know, what category to put it, it kind of drives them crazy a little bit. You saw, you saw the same thing with um, how, you know, my other two films uh, that I love the most that sort of work with these same themes, The Fountain and Cloud Atlas. Critics didn't know what to do with those movies either because there was, again, this strong transpersonal turquoise current running through it. And they're just like, ah, this is, I guess, new age wankery. We'll put it over there and write it off. Right. Um, so I thought that was interesting is seeing sort of the tone of some of the cynical mainstream response versus the actual audience response. You go to Rotten Tomatoes and look at the audience reviews and it's got like a 95% score or something like that. Um, you know, the people with the eyes to see absolutely love this movie. Um, yeah, yeah. And the people who can hear sort of those subtle transcendent themes and currents that are running through it are... are have a deeper appreciation for this film than right. someone who doesn't have those reference. Right. Um, so it's, you know, I, I just remember feeling that, that vulnerability and that vulnerability was also, you know, what I think prompted me to ask the next question, which you kind of got into a little bit, sure. but you know, one of the things Ken is that I've known you for like 20 years now, right? I mean, I've, for most of my adult life, I've, I've known you. Yeah. So when I watch a movie like this, it's fairly easy for me to gauge like, you know, how did Stuart do? Did he, personify Ken? Did he inhabit the role? And it's, oh my God, yes, it was kind of uncanny. (laughs) He had these like little subtle, I don't know, gesticulations that just like so reminded me of you, like he did a really good job. But when I started to think about, you know, Trey's character, how well did Mina capture Trey? I'm like, I have no idea. All we have of Trey is this one video um, yeah, I believe yeah. it's the only video, you know, of her in the world right now. And right. it was included in the movie, but it's like, you had to reverse an entire reverse engineer, an entire character and their mannerisms and their charismas and so forth out of this clip and off of the text of the, of the original book. And I imagine that must've been tremendously challenging for both Sebastian as a, as a director and also for Mina who wants to you know, embody this role, inhabit this role as authentically as she possibly can. Um, so I'm, I was very, very curious as to whether or not you were able to recognize Treya in her performance. And it sounds like you did, or at least partially. Yeah. And I, I, I was interested um, <clears throat> because a lot of the central players in the movie are on social media so they would talk about what their role is and what it means to them and whether they're having trouble getting into it or not and Stuart Townsend who played me and Nina Subari who played Treya would write about these and Nina was particularly open and saying this is really one of the most transformative role she's ever played in her life and that the more she got into Treya and understood what she was all about the more extraordinary she felt she could actually inhabit her and do well and so I'll say maybe two categories of um, judgment Mm -hmm. one is like Let me just give an extreme example. Let's say you watch a biography of Marilyn Monroe and somebody's playing Marilyn Monroe. And I sometimes like these biographical movies, but often I don't, especially if they're really great stars, because the one thing that you can't reproduce or act in like Marilyn Monroe is the absolute radiance 
of what she presented. Mm -hmm. When she was on screen, you couldn't take your eyes off of her. She was just so radically, radiantly, exuberantly just busting out with this stuff. And then yet you could watch somebody not be able to express that kind of A plus charisma, but could still do a fairly good job on that quality. But then on all the other things, getting her mannerisms right, doing all the things that she would do, all the little ways that she would act and all of that, and can just nail those. So I would say that Nena absolutely nailed all of the specific technical details. And in terms of the sort of charismatic radiance that Treya just poured off of her, I thought Nena gave a very close approximation to mm -hmm. that, I would say. Um, but one of the stories, my favorite stories to tell about Treya is that when people first met her, almost all of them were struck with her integrity and her honesty and her transparency. It just really kind of took your breath away. And we used to, when we were going to maybe study with a particular Buddhist teacher, we'd get in line to go up and get blessed by the teacher and uh, have them say a few words to us or something. And I was generally first in line and I'd get my blessing. And then I always stood aside and watched their, how they reacted to Treya. And they, this happened like nine out of 12 times. The teacher would just kind of be taken aback mm. and go ahead and go through the motions. And then he would always turn to his assistant and say, who was that? Like, because he was so taken right. by the depth of her integrity and her transparency. Um, that is something that nobody could repeat or play. So I understood that, and I really wasn't looking for that. Um, but for all the other aspects, um, all of her mannerisms, how she would act, how she would react, how she would cry, how she would be joyful. All of those were right on the mark. Mm. And I didn't feel that she was off base once in her entire performance. Wow. So I was really glad. And, and just in terms of her performance, I told Sebastian, the director and producer of the film that I thought she should get at least nominated for an Academy Award. Yeah. She really did that good a job. Yeah, it was exquisite. Uh, um, portraying her. Yeah, it was exquisite. Um, Again, hearing you talk about this reminds me of, you know, some of the early conversations you used to have back in the integral naked days with Julia Ormond and with Saul Williams about this whole concept of an integral actor's studio. Um, you know, and, and I think one of the things that you would talk to them about is how, you know, when you are a performer and you are trying to capture a role like this, well, let's just say Marilyn Monroe, like you said, you will never be able to imitate someone else's shine, right? right. Someone else's transmission. You can't, you can't sort of imitate that as an object out there that I'm going to sort of, you know, rehearse and, you know, try to right. do my, my, my best kind of version of your only option as an actor is to find that shine within yourself and let it radiate. And right. it's going to be a different, it's going to be a different right. flavor of shine. You're never going to be, have the same charismatic transmission as Marilyn right. Monroe, but you might be able to tap into something that is bringing you to a similar space in yourself that you're then able to release right. and to share. And people will notice that um, in your performance. Right. And I th that feels like a really, uh, again, just a, a challenge, a huge challenge for any actor that's going to be taking a role such as this 
And it actually shows, I think, how much juice there is still in this whole idea of an integral actor's studio. And, you know, just in terms right. of helping us embody comprehensively as much of a character as we possibly can, as much of their cosmic address as we can, and then sort of supplementing it with some of our own when we need to. Right. Yeah. yeah I think that's right. And I think that Mena Subari, um, although she wasn't exposed to a lot of these ideas before she took up the role, she started getting into them, mm. and particularly because she started getting into Treya. And the more she read her journal excerpts, and the more she got to know what was going on and heard the story, she really got involved uh, deeply in portraying this role. And I thought that was great. I really did. Yeah, I remember a similar story from when uh, Jennifer Aniston was considering uh, doing the role. And this was, geez, 10, 12 years ago or something yeah. like that. But I, I remember you telling stories of Jennifer Aniston and I think it was right. Brad Pitt, like reading right. Grace to each other. And that's really what it seems to be. You fall in love with these characters and you, you, you want to emulate, you want right. to really sink into this. And again, just allow their shine to kind of permeate, you know, your own being so that you can, right. you know, be that much more of yourself. Um, right. Yeah, no, it's 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 really powerful how how texts like this really draw us in, and you know actually make us want to be better. They 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 make us want to bring more of ourselves um, online, which is right one of the beautiful aspects of, of Treya's story, particularly right. as you as you captured it. And it's often one of the really high praises for an actor when he's playing a role is that they'll say he disappeared into the role. And that is taken as just the highest possible compliment you can get. Yep. And as Mena studied Treya more and more, she was able to disappear into Treya more believably and more believably, even though without that major charismatic component, uh, she did just by learning it and reading about how people would react to Treya and learn that she could, when she started disappearing into Treya, that was what she was trying to disappear into. And I think she did, like I say, on balance, a really superb job. So I was just delighted to see that um, because that was the one I was most worried about I figured out, well, if the guy screws me up, I can live with that. Right. But let's right. don't screw Treya up. Right. And I had known Mina Suvari as an actress for quite a while. I had seen several of her films and I just loved her. She was just this very sort of off kilter, different type of actress that I just found her riveting. So I was delighted to see her work out as well as she did. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you for the reflections, Ken. And I wanna, I wanna stick with Grace and Grit, but I wanna kind of transition us into, um, you know, one of the first big categories of our conversation about integral love today, which is um, love within the context of waking up and how we actually practices that we can do and perspectives that we can take that allow us to more fully wake up to love. Um, and so let me just read this next question. Um, so this is number two. This is number two. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was one very significant part of the book that right. for whatever reason didn't make it into the film, but right. I thought it was absolutely pivotal when I first read the book. And I'll just read this quote. It's, so it's become a very famous quote, Ken, but, um, yeah. but let me just read it. And there, there it was. That was exactly why she had so insistently asked me to promise that I would find her. It wasn't that she needed me to find her. It was that through my promise to her, she would therefore find me and help me yet again and again and again. I had it all backwards. I thought my promise was how I would help her, whereas it was actually how she would reach and help me again and again and forever again, as long as it took for me to awaken, 
unquote. It's such a beautiful quote, Ken, and brings us right to the heart of our conversation today. I was hoping that you might unpack this a little bit and speak about that intersection between our finite love in the relative temporal world and the timeless love that radiates from behind and beyond all things. Right. What exactly did you mean when you said that you got it all backwards? Right. Um, Trey and I met in um, Francis Vaughn and Roger Walsh's house. Um, and they had been, I had been staying there for about a year, and they were always trying to find sort of the perfect date for me. And so Roger tended towards, let's say, Playboy type models. <laughs> As and, Roger does, we all know Roger. <laughs> yeah. So I said, okay. And I would go out with several of those, and they were all gorgeous and voluptuous and all of that. But I, we were sort of missing the point on maybe a little bit more holistic type of love object, so to speak. And Francis was always setting me up with girls that were, let's say, good for my soul. So not necessarily very playboy looking, but very, <laughs> very much into spirituality and could discuss the Tory and all of this kind of stuff for me. And after kind of a year of getting both of their suggestions, I had sort of given up. And then one day, Roger Walsh came in. Again, this is after about a year of them setting me up with dates. And he says, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I've got the perfect woman for you. Her name is Terry Killam. And Terry was what Treya's name was before she changed it. So what I was thinking when I heard that was, yeah, I've been there. I think I'll take a skip on that. Uh, but thanks a lot. And then three days later, Francis Vaughn came in and said, I can't believe it. I've got the perfect girl for you. Her name is Terry Killam. <laughs> and I just... My mouth just dropped open. And the first words out of my mouth were seriously, I looked at Francis and I said, I'll marry her. This had to be an absolutely gorgeous, playboy gorgeous woman who was good for my soul. And that, how could you not want something like that? And um, the next couple of days I talked to them, had them call her. She had given up on dating. Um, she hadn't accepted a date in like two years. Um, and I was in effect giving up on the process because I wasn't having that kind of good luck. But we got together and ate dinner at Sam Keen's house, which was Sam Keen was a fairly well-known psychology today writer. And he lived in a very nice home over on Muir Beach, which is a small beach area on the other side of the bay. And there were a lot of nice houses there and he had a nice one. So we were eating dinner and we finished eating dinner and went out and sat down on the porch looking out at the ocean. And at one point, I just sort of automatically put my arm around her. And what happened was, well, maybe I should preface it by saying, I had been practicing Buddhist meditation or various forms of meditation, Buddhist, Zen in particular, and Tibetan Buddhism for about 20, 25 years, I had had several, you're not supposed to say these kinds of things, but I'd had several Satori waking up experiences. Um, and when you have a Satori, 
one of the things that you feel is that your self identity expands to the entire universe. And that's your capital S big self or big mind. And it embraces everything that's arising. And you are that you are all of that. So I had had a couple of those and I knew what they were. And when I put my arm around Treya, I, there was this instant, almost electrical shot running through my body. And it was as big a Satori as I had ever had. And I felt just absolutely one with her and one with the entire cosmos, literally. Um, it so-called cosmic consciousness, unity consciousness, ultimate divine oneness. And I was so taken by it because it was so strong and so unexpected that I just sat there for almost 15 minutes and didn't move. Finally, I got up enough capacity to talk and I looked at her and I said, has anything like this ever happened to you? And all she said was, no. The same thing had been going on in her that was going on in me. Mm -hmm. And this was a profound connection of love at the deepest level that I had ever experienced it and the deepest level that I could imagine. And this is from, again, all of my readings of the world's spiritual traditions. So that love became a constant background source of our togetherness for all five years. And uh, through all the ups and downs we went through, we still could always fall back on this unchanging, ever-present, infinite love. Mm. And that was always um, something that we really counted on. And it really kept a lot of difficulties that we had to go through, particularly all of her chemotherapy which was torturous and absolutely sadistic treatments. Um, plus she had to have several surgeries as she kept getting recurrences of this cancer. The cancer, by the way, when she was first diagnosed with it and she was diagnosed with cancer 10 days after we were married and the average maximum lifespan of that type of cancer was five years. And, but that meant more likely it was one year, two year, three years, four years. But a few people would live to five years. The survival rate with this cancer beyond five years was 0.0%. .0 in other words, that's what you're looking at. We did everything right, and we got five years and three months. So that was at least something. Yeah. Um, but that, the difficulties that we had to deal with, including going to the Yonker Clinic in Germany, as Treya kept having, re um, recursions and the Yonker clinic is so well known for its extremely high chemotherapy that people often have to be put on life support system to be kept alive and through all of that we have this background love that was supporting us and um It was also a hard period for me because I had been writing every day of my life 
for some 20, 25 years before I met her. And as men often do, I sort of defined myself as my job and my profession. So when I thought of myself as who am I or what am I, it would always come up, I'm a writer and I write on this and I write on that. And I had to stop writing in order to take care of Treya. And for the first year that I did that, it was extremely hard for me. But then I had kind of a break and switched around and just stopped identifying with being a writer and started um, what's often called selfless service. Mm -hmm. And this was something that I had, I knew about, I'd written about it, but I hadn't really had a full body taste of what a selfless service meant. But I switched over that second year. And for the next four years, I was selfless service, not, I wasn't writing. I just basically spent 24 hours a day taking care of Treya and all the different things we had to do. Um, and so when, and it was obvious to me that we had that love for whatever reason, it was a, we're gonna talk about second person love mm -hmm. in a second, but this was an example of second person, infinite love. And so the truth of the matter is we were doing it for each other. And that was just the mechanism of it. It was a joint interconnected gift that we were giving each other. And the last month that she was alive, she started saying, because I had whispered in her when we got married, I whispered in her ear, I've been looking for you for lifetimes. I promise I'll always find you. And in the last months of her life, that promise kept coming back to her. And she would repeat it often. She'd say, you promise you'll find me. And I go, yes, I promise. But what I saw after she died was that because she was repeating the promise that you'll find me, the emphasis was being put on what I was bringing to this love. And so I just started kind of thinking that way because I was always answering her question, promise you'll find me. And I go, yes, I promise. So I got just a little unbalanced about how, well, it was me finding you that gave me that feeling mm. of connectedness to an infinite love. And so, that's when I started realizing that her always saying, promise me you'll find me, um, wasn't that I was bringing this ingredient to the infinite love, but we both were. And so she was actually reaching out to get me to understand that she was bringing this to me just as much as I was bringing it to the occasion. And that's why I said I had it backwards, that it wasn't just I was bringing this to her, but that she was bringing it to me. Yeah. And that's exactly the truth. So I had let it slip into almost the opposite that I was bringing this to this relationship. And that was, I said, that's where I got it exactly backwards. 
that she was bringing it to this love connection. Um, and that was really a turnaround for me. Yeah. Um, and so it made a big difference in how I connected with her and continued to have this connection with her after she physically died that I felt just this absolute overpowering oneness of love and connection and consciousness and energy. Um, and as a direct immediate experience, that stayed with me for at least a month after Treya died. And usually if you have those kinds of strong experiences, they'll stay with you a few hours or a few days, maybe a week or so. But this was a straight month. And it faded into about six months after that, as I continued to just ingest, take in all of the stuff that she had given me. And that was a powerful, powerful period for me. And I really felt that she had, you know, the Tibetan Book of the Dead maintains that when you die, you get plunged into the first realm you get plunged into is a completely expansive, infinite consciousness. And if you've practiced during your life, then you can recognize that state upon death and you can become one with that enlightened mind. And then if you don't see it, you can track down from the causal into subtle and then peaceful and wrathful deities will come by and all of that. And then if you see those, you can latch on to the bright colored forms of them and get access to a Buddha heaven or someplace like that. And then if you miss that, you can track again down into gross realm. And there, if you're a boy, you see a man and a woman making love and you step in to try to separate them and particularly push the man away and embrace the mother, very Freudian stuff. And then you are immediately born according to which of those you latched on to. And if you're to become a girl, you go down and you do the same thing. You try to separate the parents and only you latch on to the father. So you really are born a girl. So out you come as a gross boy or a gross girl. But I was convinced that when Treya died, I mean, I thought there was actually a moment where I heard a huge snap in the room. And I thought I actually ducked, it was so loud. And I realized that that was her snapping into mm. that enlightened state. And it was perfectly clear to me at any event. And I realized that you can make up all sorts of other, it was a fantasy, it was a Freudian hallucination, any of those, but none of them really struck home with me and I'm really hit right. And I felt that I had really been transmitted that same awakening state. And that's why I stayed in that state for so long. Like I say, upwards of a, a month actually. So that was the important point of me realizing that I wasn't just the one that was bringing this to the relationship. She was. Yeah. And then I had it, in I sense, exactly backwards. Um, and that was the important part of that love. Um, and it was a love that from the moment we really met, at Sam Keen's house where I put my arms around her. And Treya used to always call it after that, she says, it wasn't love at first sight, 
It was love at first touch. And that's essentially what it was. Um, and that was the bedrock of the next five years of our life, right to her death as an enlightened state. Um, and so, well, when we get to spirit and second person, I'll talk about how hard that yeah. understanding hit me. Yeah. No, Ken, thank you. That's um, a, a gorgeous response. Thank you. And, you know, it's clear to me as I hear you talk, Ken, that um, the role that you were performing for Treya of selfless service, yeah. that continued long after she passed. Yeah. Right. I mean, you just talked about how, you know, when you got it backwards, what you mean by that was that it was Treya who inducted you into this sort of timeless love that you're talking about right now. Right. Well, you in turn, after her passing, transmuted the pain and the heartbreak and the love and the intensity and, you know, the entire story, you transmuted that into meaning that you then shared with all of us. Right. So Treya inducted you into this eternal love. You right. then invited us by writing that book, right? By writing it as beautifully and authentically as you possibly could, you invited us into that same space where we could also share at least a sliver, just right. a sliver of that eternally radiant, timeless love that you guys shared. Right. And I think that it, you know, I feel it right now in my heart. Um, yeah. You know, it continues to shine. It continues to radiate. And I think a lot of that has been because of, um, you know, I, I, as I'm asking you these questions, Ken, it occurs to me that like, these are not fun or easy or comfortable questions to, to, to answer. And, and I'm sure you're getting them a lot right now because you're being asked, you know, a lot of questions about this movie. And I want to be yeah. sensitive to the fact that like, this is not easy stuff for you to talk about even you know this many decades after after it happened but right. yet here you remain um you know uh giving us these these beautiful reflections and you know hearing you talk about this ken what it does is it 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 makes me appreciate the story that much more it draws me in that much more and you know just like i said to sebastian in my email that night it actually makes me feel closer to you which after knowing you for 20 years that in itself is um, a real gift. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, I just want to thank you for, for responding to these questions um, as, as, you know, with sort of the openness and the vulnerability and the authenticity uh, that you did. It was I, 